Now, for the first time, we're getting a preview of what might be in a replacement bill. Senator Rand Paul, Republican of Kentucky, has written the first draft of a piece of legislation. He's here to share it with us exclusively. Senator, thanks so much for being here. We appreciate it. Morning. Thanks for having me. So I'm going to get to your bill in just a second, but first I have to ask you about a big story going on this weekend, this Martin Luther King weekend. Uh, Congressman John Lewis uh, obviously suggesting uh, that President-elect Trump, in his view, is not legitimate because of the Russian hacking. Mr. Trump took to Twitter on Saturday and attacked him. Uh, he wrote, quote, um, John Lewis should spend more time on fixing and helping his district, which is in horrible shape and falling apart not to mention crime infested rather than falsely complaining about the election results. All talk, 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 no action or results. Sad. Then later in the day, President like Trump tweeted, Congressman John Lewis should finally focus on the burning and crime infested inner cities of the U.S. I can use all the help I can get. Now, Senator Paul, you make and have made a concerted effort to reach out to communities of color. Uh, as senator and as a presidential candidate, I went with you when you went to Howard University. What, what's your response uh, to what President-elect Trump tweeted at John Lewis? You know, I've worked with John Lewis, met him several times. I've worked with many members of the Black Caucus and many progressive Democrats, frankly, on the idea of criminal justice reform. So I think I have a good relationship with him. But I would also be one who says, and I, and I do appreciate what uh, him being a civil rights icon, but I would also say that that doesn't make us immune from criticism or debate. So John Lewis isn't in a position where there can't be a healthy debate back and forth because he's a civil rights icon, shouldn't make him immune. But I would say that uh, instead of this bickering back and forth, what I'd like to find out is how we can still do criminal justice reform. And I've been talking to Democrats about how we get more Republicans on board. Um, I was disappointed we didn't get it through, you know, when President Obama was in. But I think there still is some chance to reform some of our criminal justice system. And I'm willing to work with John Lewis and others on that. Just a last, last question on this, and then I want to get to Obamacare. Um, I think one of the things people are taking issue with is not the question about whether John Lewis is immune from criticism. Obviously, he's a partisan Democrat, uh, and he said President like Trump is illegitimate. Certainly lots of room to criticize there uh, in terms of, of what he's saying a few days before the inaugural. But the question of describing his district as crime infested, urging him to focus on burning inner cities, and referring to this man, who you refer to as an icon, accurately, uh, as all talk, no action, I think on Martin Luther King Day weekend, I think that struck a lot of people as a little tone deaf, including many Republicans. Yeah, I, uh, but, I th but I think it gets one-sided sometimes. In Jeff Sessions' uh, you know, nomination hearings, there were three African-American legislators, Cory Booker, John Lewis, and um, I think Cedric Richmond came forward and decided to testify against Jeff Sessions. But there were also three African-Americans who had worked with him and known him for years and years who testified in his favor. So I think we shouldn't, when things involve race, it gets very, very sensitive. All of us, or none of us, actually want to be considered to be either racially insensitive. And so it's a very, very important subject. But I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't ignore that people are partisan. So John Lewis is a partisan. I have a great deal of respect for him, but he's a partisan, and I disagree with him on issues. I should be able to honestly disagree with him and not have it all come back to I have no appreciation for civil rights uh, icon because of this. And I think that's the part that I think sometimes unfair in this. Let's turn to health care. I want you to hear from a Kentucky resident who voted for Donald Trump and is now concerned about possibly losing Obamacare. Take a listen. You supported Donald Trump for this election. I did. I did. But if Obamacare goes away... If Obamacare goes away, we're going to be in world depression. But you want the jobs that Trump promised. I want the jobs, yes. But Trump you want the health care that Obama's provided. I do. I do. I want, I want, I do. And I know it sounds weird. I know I'm not telling you anything you don't know, sir, but more than 400,000 people in your great Commonwealth of Kentucky have been able to get health insurance because of Obamacare, whether through the Medicaid expansion or through subsidized private insurance, uh, the plan uh, that your former governor set up. Tell us about the replacement bill that you plan to introduce. Can you guarantee all 400,000 of, uh, 400, of those people in Kentucky are going to be able to keep their coverage? You know, I think the interesting thing about the, the woman's comment is, is that she wants care. She also wants a job. And so we need policies that create more jobs because the more jobs that are created, obviously, the less need there is for government to jump in. I believe that it's incredibly important that we do replacement on the same day as we do repeal. We've had six years to complain, and we have complained. I've been one of those complaining about Obamacare. Replacement should be the same day. 
The replacement bill that we put together, our goal is to ensure the most amount of people give access to the most amount of people at the least amount of cost. And I think this is where Obamacare failed. They wanted to ensure people, their motives were good, their heart was in the right place, but they put so many mandates in it that they made it too expensive. So what's happening in the individual market, which is about six or 7% of the market, you have companies like Blue Cross of North Carolina losing $400 million because young, healthy people don't want to buy it because they're told, hey, you can get it anytime after you get sick. And so that they've broken the insurance model. The other problem with Obamacare is they put these mandates and said that every insurance policy has to have 10 items, things like pregnancy and dental coverage and all these things, which are great, but they add cost and that forced people out of the market. So one of the key reforms that we'll do is we're going to legalize the sale of inexpensive insurance. That means getting rid of the Obamacare mandates on what you can buy. We're going to help people save through health savings accounts as well as a tax credit. And then the, one of the things that we need to talk more about, and this is the third part of the replacement bill, is we're going to allow individuals to come together in associations to buy insurance. I understand as a small business person, I had a doctor's office with four employees. If one of my employees got cancer, it was devastating to the bottom line, not only to them, obviously, but to the bottom line of insurance. But there's no reason why someone with four employees shouldn't be able to join with hundreds and hundreds of other uh, businesses that are small to become a large entity to get leverage to bring your prices down, but also to get insurance that can't cancel you and uh, guarantees the uh, issue of the insurance even if you get sick. So, Senator, what will happen to the people in Kentucky who now have health insurance because of, uh, because of the Medicaid expansion? Will Medicaid expansion remain uh, or will it be taken away as your new bill, theoretically, uh, takes for goes forward? I think that's the big question. And I don't think that's going to be in the replacement aspect. I think that's going to be in the repeal aspect. There's going to be a vote on, uh, it's, a, it's a fancy term, budget reconciliation, which has to do with once a budget's passed, you can by simple majority alter things that have to do with the budget. That's how Obamacare is going to be repealed. The vast majority of people that got insurance under uh, President Obama's Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, got it through Medicaid. So what we have to decide is what can be kept and what can't be kept, and that's going to be part of repeal. But I will make this point, this is an incredibly important point. Everybody says, oh, well, what are we going to do? We're going to give these people care. The other question is, where are we going to get the money is what I ask. We borrow a million dollars a minute. We owe $20 trillion with this enormous debt. My point is we should be honest about it. If Kentucky or Tennessee or Ohio wants to expand Medicaid and they, want, they say well, you have a lot of people struggling, we're going to help them, that's fine. Probably we should then raise the taxes on everybody in Kentucky to pay for Medicaid. Instead, we had this deceitfulness that President Obama said it would be free, it would be taken care of 100% by the federal government, but we have no money in Washington. You know, we have a $20 trillion debt, so it's not honest accounting. So I'd say if you want to have more Medicaid, you should say we're going to have to have higher taxes to pay for it. Senator Paul, I have to ask you, uh, you've now heard testimony from Rex Tillerson, Donald Trump's nominee to be Secretary of State. You are on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. At this point, are you prepared to say that you would vote for him to be Secretary of State? Yes, I will vote for Rex Tillerson. I was very impressed. And one of the things I was very impressed with was one of the introductions by Sam Nunn, a former Democrat, but somebody who did a lot of uh, history in arms control and realizes how important dialogue is. We have so dumbed down and simplified this whole idea of whether Tillerson would be a friend of Russia or this and that. We want dialogue and engagement. And the one thing Sam Nunn mentioned is he said, you know what, in the deepest, darkest throes of the Cold War, when we were at such great odds with the Soviet Union, and when we knew there were terrible human rights abuses and they were, you know, doing proxy wars around the globe, we still talked to the Russians. This is really important because we've, on both sides, Republican and Democrat saying like, what are you gonna do, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna call him a war criminal? And it's like, well, no, maybe we're just going to have discussions and engagement. doesn't mean we're going to acquiesce or we're going to say the Russians are right or we won't stand up to them. All of that has to happen. But we also have to realize that uh, we have enough nuclear weapons on both sides to blow up the world, that it's incredibly important that we always maintain a dialogue with the Russians. Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky, always good to see you, sir. Thanks for coming in. We appreciate it. Hope to see you soon. Thanks, Jake.